Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, November 13th, 2014 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. We'll begin the meeting by having the clerk call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Ludie Ball? Present. Ms. Laura Brown? Present. Ms. Anne Hennessy? Present. Ms. Dan Meyer? Here. Mr. Ben Here. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Mr. Kerry Porter? Here. Mr. Edward. Present. 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 <coughs> Thank you very much. The first item on our agenda this evening is the public comment period. So anyone who wishes to speak in public comment can see if we have a sign up sheet. Thank you. So we do have a sign up sheet. Um, and uh, the first person who signed up is Stephanie Gomaldi. And I, um, I have a three-minute timer that I'll use. <laughs> good, so, I like that. Uh, That's good for time. So uh, if you'll just, again, say your name and address for the record and proceed. Sure. Um, Stephanie Grimaldi, 42 Platinum Circle. I have a first grader, a seventh grader, and a tenth grader in the Northampton Public Schools. Um, I came tonight to talk about the increase in the, Focke, in the hockey fee that was noted on the website. Um, since writing the letter that I'm going to read tonight anyway, I've had a, a phone call. Um, with Candace, the business manager, and I'd like to thank and acknowledge her and the superintendent for being very responsive to a phone call I made to them on Monday regarding this issue. My understanding is that the topic is now under investigation, that it will be brought to all of you to discuss. And so the reason I'm reading this letter is so that you have the reasons that um, I and my husband and my family were um, concerned about the fee increase, and it may inform your further discussions. So there's that. Um, my son is a sophomore that plays varsity ho ice hockey at Northampton High School. The team is a co-op team hosted by East Hampton High School. About six current Northampton High School students play on the team. Last season, as new parents to Northampton High School, we were told that the hockey fee had traditionally been set at twice the regular athletic fee since it's considered an expensive sport. This doubling seemed like a reasonable policy. We registered him and paid $350. Two weeks ago, I went to register for this season through the Northampton High School website. I was shocked to find a $500 fee to play this season. Without discussion or any advanced communication, the hockey fee was increased by more than 40%. This unilateral and late decision concerns me for many reasons, only a few of which I will elaborate upon here. I'm extremely concerned that the fee for hockey and the process used to determine it is not subject to any documented policy. This year it was increased by $150 with no advance communication to parents by the administration. Will I go to register next season and find the fee increased to $650? How can I plan my household budget when I have no clear way of knowing what the fee might be? How can one set of athletic fees be planful and part of the budget process and one team's fee be discretionary? Furthermore, as I understand it, no other varsity hockey team in the area, including the three other teams in our cooperative program, have a player fee that even approaches $500. I have come to understand that the athletic department has been operating at a deficit for some years, and A.D. Dupre has indicated that a portion of that deficit can be attributed to hockey. I also understand that there are many new people in decision-making positions, and that some issues regarding budgeting and fees for hockey may be inherited, and that allocating very limited dollars for diverse needs is complicated. However, I don't believe that this is a problem that I or any other parents of hockey players should solve in the short or long term for the district by standing by and allowing our fee exclusively to be drastically raised without due process. There must be a way to more equitably address the maintenance of the program as other local districts have seemingly been able to do so without fees of this magnitude. There is no line item in the budget for our coaches, leading me to wonder that if we are the only team that needs to pay for our share of the coaching stipend out of the general athletic budget rather than the $160,000 plus allocated in the high school budget for stipends for coaches and other after school advisors. Yeah. You can finish. Thank you. Um, this team is not new to the athletic Congrats. department or the district. We have played in this co-op for many years. The costs are not unknown, nor can I imagine they fluctuate widely from year to year. It is unclear to me why, at minimum, that the Northampton portion of the coaching stipend is not paid with the same monies as all other coaching stipends at Northampton High School. There are many other related issues I believe required attention and consideration, not the least of which is what role and contribution we feel varsity athletics play in our children's overall development and education, and to what extent we are willing to devalue that by imposing a prohibitive fee. Those can and should be raised as the school committee and administration move into the budget season. But winter sports registration is right now, and I'm extremely uncomfortable with how we got to the $500 fee. 
Will paying the 500 set the ex expectation that parents are fine with the fee and send the message that this process is okay moving forward? I hope not. It is critical that a process be established that allows all stakeholders to be heard on fee increases for this sport, just as the establishment of the normal athletic player fee is debated, debated and determined as part of the budget process. Thanks. Sorry, I went over. I'll put you in the penalty box. <laughs> over talking. <coughs> okay, the next speaker is Rita McKenzie Anderson. Hope I got that right. Yes, you did. Uh, my name is Rita McKenzie Anderson, and I live at uh, 251 Park Hill Road in Florence. And um, I'm another hockey mom to talk about the hockey fees. Uh, I want to read this letter. I understand some progress has been made, and I appreciate the responsiveness um, about that. But I'd like to express my concerns. I am the parent of a Northampton High School junior who plays ice hockey through the co-op program that Northampton has with East Hampton High School. I am very concerned about the way that athletic fees are being applied to this program. During my son's first two years in this program, we paid the regular athletic fee at the beginning of the season, $150 his first year, $175 his second year, and then paid that amount again at the end once Northampton's share of the co-op costs were computed. This year, we have been told that we have to pay $500 in full prior to the beginning of the season and that only $175 of that $500 will be counted toward the family cap for sports, which I believe is $600. This came as a total surprise to all the families involved. The idea that maybe this would be difficult for some families does not appear to matter to the people who set the fee. Most families operate on budgets. You expect to pay 175 in November and then another 175 in early spring. I don't know too many families that have an extra $325 lying around in November to quickly and easily pay for a greatly increased hockey fee. I still do not know how this sudden increase happened. Aren't athletic fees set by the school committee as part of the budgeting process? Does the athletic director have the authority to raise the fee for any sport at any time based on projected costs? When and how and by who was the decision made to so greatly increase the athletic fee this year, and why were parents never informed? Is there no room for discussion, negotiation, or compromise? And what is the sense of having a yearly cap on fees if someone can decide that not all athletic fees apply to the cap? Any parent who has supported their child to play hockey knows that it is an expensive sport, and none of us will deny that. I think all of us are open to paying a larger athletic fee to support our student athletes. But I'm concerned about the communication. Why is the communication about this been so poor? Why can't we work together to address this and work towards some sort of compromise for this year? The $500 fee far exceeds what the other three schools involved in the co-op pay. In closing, I would like to quote from the Northampton High Handbook, which says, the philosophy of athletics as offered at Northampton High School may be stated as the effort to encourage and to provide the maximum opportunity for athletic participation for physical, moral, mental, and social growth in a competitive environment. Speaking for myself, the way this hockey athletic fee is being handled is not encouraging and is not providing maximum opportunities for my son's growth. I am a single parent, actually a newly single parent. Surprising me with a $325 increase over what I paid at this time last year is certainly not being experienced as the school being supportive of my son's development or understanding of the financial budgeting that most families need to do. Is that my three minutes or is that something else? That was three minutes. Okay. You can finish. Two more. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> I'll take a penalty too. Yeah. Um, I want to make it very clear that I think this process around the hockey fee has been unfair, arbitrary, and not at all transparent. I am requesting that consideration be given to reevaluating the two decisions made this year about the $500 fee being fully payable initially and the idea that only $175 of that $500 counts toward the family cap. I am also requesting that a more transparent and inclusive process be established for setting hockey fees for the 2015-16 academic year. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker is Steve Harrell. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Harrell. I live at 474 Elm Street. It's good to see you all again. Um, 
I'm sure you've enjoyed your vacation from hearing me speak so often about the start time at Northampton High School, uh, but that period must now come to a close <laughs> because, for example, I want to remind you that last spring at budget time, you felt you didn't have enough data to determine what bus costs would be necessary to accommodate a later start time at the high school. Busing expenses seem to be the main remaining hurdle to make this change. Last spring, you did have in hand a report from our bus consultants, Versatrans, showing in black and white how to make this change at an additional cost of $84,000 a year. However, this was on the basis of the number of pass holders in our city. We know already from various sources that actual ridership on the buses every day is much, much lower than this. Therefore, it is clear that the additional bus expense required would be considerably less than 84,000 if it were based on ridership rather than pass holders. Again, both Brian Salzer and our city solicitor confirmed there is no law or regulation requiring a school district, district to provide a seat on a bus for every pass holder. On this basis, then, you voted to direct Dr. Provost to collect data on bus ridership and submit that to you by February 15, so that next year you will know exactly what will be required before the budget is about to be passed. I trust that this schedule is on course. Soon you'll have all the info you asked for in due time, and you won't need to push the issue aside again, as has been done every year since about 2006. On another note, it was in the news recently that in Fairfax County, Virginia, adjacent to D.C., they voted in a start time delay of 40 minutes for next fall for their 22 high schools. They committed a sum of money for additional busing for the later start. They felt it was a, as worthy a program as any other. Their superintendent said, I was determined to find a solution and not make excuses. In an editorial about this, the Washington Post said, quote, that should be a lesson for school districts that agree about the benefits of later start times, but have yet to find a way to make it happen, end quote. Now, I don't think that you, the Northampton School Committee, need to learn a lesson uh, because you've done your lessons on this subject and you've, you've done so much good work so far. Um, my point here is simply to just be sure you keep it on track. Look, I have 24 more seconds. <laughs> I will say, I will use that time to thank you so much for your good work. I don't want to be against you on this subject. I want to work with you. And I also hope the city council will approve your much deserved pay increase. You should be paid much, much more than 5,000 even. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we'll now move on to announcements. Are there any announcements by the city uh, school committee? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to the recommended actions. And uh, tonight, the consent agenda <coughs> before you um, contains several uh, minutes. The minutes of the superintendent evaluation subcommittee of May 7th. Uh, 2012, June 6, 2012, July 11, 2012, September 6, 2012, September 18, 2012, and September 24, 2012, as well as a special school committee meeting of January 17, 2013, a school committee meeting October 9, 2014, and a meeting of the super, superintendent evaluation team November 3, 2014. You also have three contracts for approval. Uh, Sign Techniques Incorporated, <coughs> it's an amendment to the NHS Digital Marquee Contract, $2,095.82. The Collaborative for Educational Services, Technical and Evaluation Assistance to the Prevention Coalition, that's $20,000, 475. Extent Corporation, Special Education IEP Software, $15,060. There are also three field trip requests, the NHS academic team, pre-holiday academic tournament in South Burlington, Vermont, December 5th through 6th, 2014, <clears throat> the NHS choral students, Empire State Building and Broadway show in New York City, March 18th 
2015. And finally, the eighth grade French students going to Quebec City, Quebec on May 22nd through the 24th, 2015. Is there a motion uh, to move to approve the consent agenda? Okay. <coughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any ab any abstentions? Okay. So aye. the con can I just ask an informational question? I'm curious. Sure. What does the IEP software do exactly? How is it, you know, different from what we currently do, or is it what we currently do? It is what we currently do. It's just a continuation of that program into another year. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we'll move into the reports and recommendations phase of the meeting, and we'll first begin by hearing from our student representative, uh, Jonathan Latender. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, fellow school committee members. This, year, this year's musical at Northampton High School is Godspell. Auditions were held Wednesday, November 5th and Thursday, November 6th, and a cast list has already been posted. The fall production of The Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilder is being held at Northampton High School next Thursday, November 20th through Saturday, November 22nd, with 7 o'clock showings and a 2 o'clock showing on Saturday. Right now, the Chris of Chris Heron event is happening at Northampton High School. It's an adult and community showing. Chris Heron is um, a Fall River native who was drafted into the NBA only to find himself following a path of drugs and addiction. His story of recovery and his new life mission of helping young people to make better choices is what the assembly is about. If teachers signed up, students got to see Chris Heron during fourth period. That was about 750 students. Progress is moving on parent and student portals for Aspen. 85% of students are online and parents are signing up every day. In Aspen, students can access grades and assignments that teachers put up, events, news, and the daily bulletin. We're getting great responses from students, teachers, and parents. Fall sports are wrapping up this year. Girls soccer, girls soccer were league champs. They went to the quarterfinals. Field hockey, um, they were also league champs, and they went to the Western Mass Finals. Gina Whalen came in second place for the Western Mass Golf Tournament. Both boys and girls uh, cross country um, had undefeated seasons. They both were PVIAC champs and Western Mass champs. They play at Franklin Park in Boston this weekend for states. Liam Sullivan and Mario Lutz won uh, uh, were the winners for each team. On November 20th at Northampton High School, there will be a student and community blood drive sponsored by the Red Cross. Uh, we will be holding our annual Goldstein Assembly on Tuesday, November 25th for the entire school. The performers will be Wyatt Jackson, Khalid Hill, and some local musicians. Uh, we are preparing for our second round of SATs at Northampton High School. They will be held on December 6th the chorus will be signing, uh, singing tree lighting, singing tree lighting in Northampton on December 6th. The Battle of the Bands concert will be held on December 12th. Quarter one ended on November 5th and report cards were handed out yesterday. Advisory groups will be starting back up a week before the Goldstein Assembly. They will, uh, there will be new groups with a new format. The groups will be organized by grade level, um, the plan is to have it two times a month and to it'll eventually replace home base. Key Club will be holding a free dodgeball tournament at Northampton High School within the coming weeks. And Guidance is holding a financial aid night to help students apply for scholarships and colleges. It's open to juniors and seniors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The um, next item on the agenda is a required vote. Uh, and this is the um, private school LEA approval, and it includes approvals for Clark School for Hearing and Speech, the Lander Grinspoon Academy, the Montessori School of Northampton, New Direction School, Smith College Campus School. And I don't know if the superintendent wishes to just make any re remarks about this approval process. The only thing that I would add to that is that I've reviewed all the packets and they're in order and I would recommend the school committee's approval of all these schools. Okay. Move approval of the private schools. Second. Okay. Any discussion or questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. I had a question. I noticed the, the question about do you provide special education and they had different answers 
from different schools. And I was wondering, can you explain? So, what what is our role with them in special education, and how do, how they how are they able to give different answers? The mandate to provide special education services does not extend to private schools. The question is asked just by the state, I think, for informational purposes. We do have a responsibility with respect to working with uh, private schools in order to identify students who are eligible for services. Um, and then typically what would happen is if a private school is assisting us in child finding, which is the technical term for identifying students, and we are able to identify a need for a child, then we'd have to work together to um, figure out what the best way of meeting the child's needs would be. Often that's by providing related services within our schools um, and then allowing the child to remain enrolled in the private school. Um, sometimes, based on the extent of the need, it, it may become um, a situation where a child may consider changing schools. So the kind of things we would provide to it would be like OT, OT PT, speech. speech. So that we send somebody to their school? Or? Um, typically, we would have the student receive the services within our schools. Any other questions before we uh, take the vote? Okay, so the motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor of, uh, of this approval say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so those, uh, those approvals are granted by the school committee. Next we have a report from the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Uh, specifically, we have second readings on the advertising contract. Uh, which is policy KHB-E for those following along. Uh, and second reading on the advertising in the schools, uh, delegation of authority, limitations, and restrictions policy revised, that's KHB-R. I would, I guess, turn to the chair of the committee to give us a, a review of that. This uh, was presented to you and the actual draft policies are included with your packets and the <coughs> So the specific changes that we are looking for is uh, are to the contract and to the policy. The contract change would allow for a longevity discount to advertisers who have been with the district for more than five years. They would receive, now I've forgotten, was it a 10% yeah. discount? Okay, and then um, the second change would allow for the superintendent and or his designee to make the decision as to the content of advertising without it having to come, the, the policy previously said that it had to come to the school committee for approval of the content. So we're just delegating now to the superintendent or designee for approval of content. And the, the language in the policy is very specific about what that content can be, so it's not like there's a lot of latitude there. It's just the formality of having to bring it to the school committee meeting, so we're looking for a quicker, easier process. Um, and this would, tonight represents the second reading on this. That is correct. And under our rules, we take three readings on these? We I'm take two readings two. and then we take a vote. Okay. But it's been recently interpreted that that would be a, a three-month process. Okay. So with any luck, may, we may bring that policy to you in the future to streamline that okay. a bit. Okay. But for now, I would say that we just had the second reading, so the policy will be on the agenda for a vote next month. Okay. And I probably won't, won't be here, so if you have any questions, call me soon. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Moore. Yeah, I do have a question. You know, the, the sort of the language restrictions, you know, whatever that is, whatever section this is, section three of the restrictions policy that just goes through a list of things which we wouldn't have allowed on our signs at the school. And I'm assuming that the, and I just, I, I'm assuming that we're, we're, we're thinking that we're allowed to restrict speech like that because it's a school and we have sort of responsibility in sort of a, you know, parental fashion for, um, for our students and what sorts of things will be posted on the school. But I don't, I don't actually know the law about that. And I, have we checked with somebody who does know the law about that to make sure that our restrictions are, you know, that we're, so that we're not setting up a lovely opportunity for a, for a you know, set, make new law? 
To be perfectly honest, I cannot say that I remember. This policy has been in effect, and we're only making these two minor changes. So this policy has actually been in effect for several years. Uh, and I don't know if it was given to an attorney when we put it in place a long time ago. Yeah, so. you know, and it could sit here. It could be not lawful for a long, long time until somebody came yes. along and wanted yeah. to pay for an ad. And, I, I and, get and, that. And then so. wanted to enough to hire some lawyers, and, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so, so it's quite possible that it would never sort of be found out. But on the other hand, I don't know that we want to put ourselves in that position. It, it seems to me that we've had an advertising policy for some period of time that, in, I mean, This is, this is relative to what's going on in the field, but I think we've had advertising in the school's policies for a long time that says that we can't have people giving out coupons and discounts for things, and we can't have anybody that's advertising certain things. And it even became an issue when we were selling ads for, uh, when the Booster Club sells ads for a sports athletic program or for the, for the theater programs. Or for newsletters at one point in time, some of the schools were selling advertising space on their newsletters that they were printing. Or even if you say, this was printed by, you know, thank you very much, printed courtesy of, is that considered advertising? So, I mean, there's a lot of very specific stuff going on with our advertising mm -hmm. policy. I'd like, to, I'd like to say that I think we had it approved by an attorney, but I'm just not going to swear to that at all. So. If you're asking, should we have it approved, we can certainly send it. Attorney Meyer. So no, I'm not, no, I'm not licensed, not licensed anymore. No, I was just curious about this when I saw this last meeting and um, the case is Perry Education Association versus Perry Local Educators Association. And the court analyzed it as a non-public, so school, um, school locations are non-public forums and therefore they don't meet the highest level of scrutiny. So Supreme Court presumes that all facilities in elementary, middle school, and high school facilities are non-public forums subject to lenient First Amendment standard of review. Uh, they had a high school newspaper was considered a non-public forum. So if it's a non-public forum, it does not receive the same degree. Recognize the special characteristics of the school environment justify giving school authorities a great deal of leeway to control speech in accord with, and there's in quotes, their basic educational mission. So I think it most likely that meets, like what I, yeah, it's, yeah, it meets, meets muster. Okay. And then it's just a question, really, <laughs> is, is, this the is this the guidelines we want to have or do we want to have more or less? Right, you could presumably have more. So no, nothing about dancing. Okay. <laughs> Card playing. <laughs> Card playing. Um, I just had one question, you said or designee, and I just was looking at the draft language and it just says superintendent. Well, in that case, so uh, you know what? <laughs> um, how shall I say? We need to revise the minutes from our last <laughs> school committee meeting, then, because okay. that's where I was, was reading. Was okay. <laughs> okay. So the so. so for clarification, it is just superintendent. It is just superintendent. Okay. Okay. So. All right. So that's uh, that. Unless there's any more questions, that's, that will constitute our second reading of this uh, policy, and it will come back to you at your next meeting for a vote. Next we have a vote, and this is on the acceptance of a gift, and this is from the UMass Institute for Training and Development, and it's a $250 gift towards uh, special education, and uh, I believe uh, I, uh, Ms. Walczak will report on that. Yes, through the UMass Institute for Training and Development, we had a group of Eastern European educators come out and spend some time in the district observing the special ed programs and meeting with administrators and staff. So as a token of, a token of appreciation, I guess we'd say they made a donation of $250 and we'd like to designate that for the special ed department's use. So this would go in a gift account being tracked for special education. Move to accept the gift. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Ms. Minnick. I, um, I, I don't even know how to say this that makes it sound right, but <laughs> I think it's, I think that the, the exchange of information is so important and this was a valuable connection to have to begin with and I would, I'm very grateful for their gift, but I hope that they didn't feel obligated in some way to make that gift because I think that the, that 
the educational accord should be the, the reward in and of itself. So, but I'm very grateful that they chose to, to make a donation in that way. Uh, so I hope we can convey that to them when we. I believe the check arrived as a surprise to the special ed director. So I would say that it was not expected was in any way. No. Okay. Well, I, I assume that somebody's going to send them a thank you note, and when mm -hmm. they when they do, I hope that you will just kind of, if you can capture that notion, that would be appreciated, at least for me. Superintendent, <coughs> I'm just wondering if this also requires creating an account to deposit into, or do we already have a special ed gift account? We don't have one for special ed. My understanding is all of our gift accounts are within one master account, so this would just be, for lack of another word, another sub-account within our gift accounts. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, all those in favor of accepting this uh, generous gift, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the gift is accepted. We have another vote on another uh, a set of gifts, and this is um, from Northampton Community Television, and it involves the gift of some uh, RAM upgrades, three Apple computers, and Adobe Master Suite uh, for the NHS Technology Department. Again, I'll turn to Ms. Walzak. These are pretty much what you've just said. We, ha we heard reference at a prior meeting of these gifts, and we wanted to follow through and get the official documentation of the gifts and the recognition of them. So the um, community television department put together the itemized list of the, the MacBooks and the other equipment that's been donated. Move to accept to the, the high school. gifts with extreme gratitude. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any uh, question or discussion about this? I think we heard Jeremy Whalen, who came to our last meeting, who spoke about this. So, um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next, we move on uh, to a, a vote uh, on the <coughs> Mass Core Implementation or District Improvement Plan modification. And I'll turn it over to <coughs> the Superintendent. Thank you. Last month, we began the process of discussing Mass Core and determining whether or not it was uh, truly representative of one of the school committee's goals for the district improvement plan process. Um, as, as you recall, the reason I had brought it before the committee was, as the plan reads, it was to be in effect this year, and it isn't. So, I w and I was looking for some direction on whether to um, We're looking for an escape hatch. <laughs> Or not. Uh, so, one of the thing, one of the um, questions that came out of that discussion was, well, <coughs> right now Northampton is at zero percent mass core completion because of the PE requirement not being offered in the high school, and that's a requirement whether or not we adopt mass core. And so, um, one of the questions that was asked was, um, well, if we just fix that. Um, how far would that bring us? So I want to direct your attention to the pie chart um, that was at your place tonight. Um, this chart was created by <coughs> reviewing the transcripts for all of our 2014 Northampton High School graduates, um, excluding students who transferred in who would be following a different process than students who were with us for um, all four years. And then sort of arbitrarily assigning them three additional PE credits and assuming that none of the um, three additional credits came by eliminating one of the other courses that was required for Mass Corps. Um, so if, you, if that were the case, um, we get a sense of how much Mass Corps we would have just by addressing the PE requirement. So um, you can see that that is the biggest piece of the pie. In fact, 74% of our students would be taking a, a course of studies that meets the Mass Core if they only had the PE. Um, <coughs> so that's the biggest part of the problem. Uh, knowing that that needed to be addressed, regardless of what the committee <coughs> decided on Mass Core, Mr. Lombardi, who's with us tonight, um, and I started the process of um, just starting discussions with teachers about you know the PE requirement and what what it might mean for us. And I think I quickly realized that um, the problem is more 
fraught with complexity than would, would seem at first blush. Um, in fact, we've built programs at the high school that in a certain sense depend upon students not taking PE. Um, in fact, we've converted some of the PE spaces over into other classroom spaces. So even if we were to just implement the, um, the requirement, a uh, certain question would be, where would we do it? Um, so um, one of the questions that kept coming up over and over again was, well, why do we even need to do this? Um, this law was last modified in 1994. Um, it was a requirement long before that. And we haven't been following it for a number of years. And no one's come and shut us down. Anyway, so why now, Mr. Superintendent, is it so important? Um, so the reason why, and I direct you to the back side of that handout, is it's now part of the coordinated program review procedure. Um, on this page, you see um, page 56 of the Ashburnham Westminster coordinated program review, which was conducted last year. The first criterion on this report is CR7B. CR there stands for civil rights. Um, and you can see in this case, they um, were found not to be in compliance um, because not all of their seniors were signed up for phys ed classes. Um, I had, this is the, this will be probably my fourth coordinated program <coughs> review that I've gone through with different districts. And this is the first time that I've seen um, the PE requirement elevated by PQA to a civil rights issue. Um, so I think that's a game changer with respect to this. Um, I did have an opportunity last um, Thursday and Friday at MASS, MASC to sit and talk with the superintendent and he said, yeah, they're serious. <laughs> when you're cited, you will have to correct it. Um, and so I think it's in our best interest to be proactive on this um, because the standard that PQA has typically is you have 12 months to correct any deficiency. So if working over the course of four years towards um, uh, compliance is likely to be disruptive, get, trying to get it all done in a single year is gonna be incredibly disruptive. Um, so my hope is that if we could um, develop a plan and demonstrate to the auditors that we're working towards compliance, we may get some leniency. I don't know if that's the case. They might say, no, get it all done next year. Um, but I, I always think it's better to be proactive rather than to be reactive. So I'd like to begin the process of working on the PE. And given the amount of um, discussion that's already taken place on this, I think that's probably enough and probably all that um, high school can take in terms of trying to um, align its requirements at this time. Um, if you look back at the chart, I think we may say, once you get the PE done, why not go for Mass Corps? Because then you're talking very small portions of um, students who are missing it. And for some of them, it's not even a, an issue of taking more classes. It's maybe an issue of timing the classes. Because when you look at the 11% of students who don't have the math requirement, many of them have four years, that, but they just didn't take math in the senior year. Um, so some of those adjustments could be easy and certainly all of them will be much easier than addressing PE. Um, so I would have two recommendations um, with respect to this. Um, one is that we modify the uh, current district improvement plan to strike um, the part that says by July 2014 we'll have a structure in place for pre-K to 12 curriculum alignment which will include Mass Core with full implementation by September 2014 and instead um, uh, right by spring of two, by the spring 2015 coordinated program review we'll have a high school program that meets the requirements for structured learning time including physical education. Um, and then secondarily, I would recommend that we form an ad hoc subcommittee to work on this because there are a number of people that need to weigh in and there are a lot of issues that need to be worked through in order to adjust the high school program of studies in a way that isn't um, <coughs> destructive of any of the other good things that they've built there. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to modify the current district improvement, improvement plan, the striking the current date and changing it to the spring of 2015. 
Do we make a second motion to form the ad hoc committee then? That can be a secondary motion. Okay. I think that's fine. Um, <coughs> so is there a second on that motion for so we can discuss it? Second. Okay. Uh, that, that motion didn't quite state what he said. So if we can, if she's just. If, she, if that was just shorthand and it's mm -hmm. going to be written exactly the way he said it, that's fine. Well, I'm sure it will be written the way he said it. Okay. Okay. We're getting a thumbs up. Your, your motion was just to change a date, and he actually was changing something that happens, not just the date. Right. And I just want to be sure that that's what you intended. Okay. Okay. So we still have a second on that? Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Still a second. Okay. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to say I'm, I'm comfortable with addressing the mass core standards later, but in the meantime, I hope that there's, they're very proactive about letting students who are applying to colleges know that these mass core standards have been adopted as, as most, for the most part, with the exception of the arts, the, the fine arts um, requirement as minimum entrance requirements for four year public colleges and universities in Massachusetts. So I feel like everybody, if you would, if you would implement a mass core, then you know that everyone who graduated, had they wished to apply, would have been eligible to apply to a four-year college and public university. But that's not the case if we don't <coughs> implement this. So I think that we need to be very conscious of making sure guidance is letting students know, like, I, I'm sorry, you don't have an interest in a foreign language or this, but those are now the requirements to get into UMass or to get into any of these other Massachusetts state schools. So I just mean in the interim, I, I want to be careful that kids aren't inadvertently falling through the cracks and being surprised by this. Okay. Um, Mr. Meyer. Just had a question about the, <coughs> the, you know, the careful wording. So when this says by the spring 2015 CPR will have a high school program, that doesn't mean that all of our students will be undertaking that program. That's it right. just means that our documents will have been changed to show our intent That's to right. provide that in some time in the future, That's presumably right. at the earliest possible one okay. um, And my other, oh, oh, um, just my other question was, um, your thought experiment included assigning four PE credits, um, which I assume is in keeping with the previously presented plan that we have three full-time PE teachers added to the staff. Um, you, had a, you had a financial, a financial impact, and obviously as it's worked out there may be wrinkles, and I'm wondering, has there any has there been any work undertaken since our last meeting about looking how participation in athletics could qualify? Because obviously that's something the students are already undertaking yeah. that might reduce the financial impact since it is considerable. Yes, um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about that. Um, the way I look at it, moving from what we're currently doing to the the minimum requirement means taking 600 new slots of PE. Mm -hmm. If they're required all to come out of other classes for traditional PE classes, I think that kills elective programs. Mm -hmm. So I'm very supportive of giving students credit for athletics. If you give students credit for athletics, it, we have about 50% um, participation in athletics now. That takes it from um, a net addition of 600 to a net addition of about 200 um, because you would have less freshmen who need to take it. Right now we have 100% of freshmen who are taking PE as a class. Um, so I think that that's a really important um, strategy that we should pursue. The issue comes up um, around equity. Um, many people have discussed, well, if my child is not um, an athlete, then that means he has to take courses out of his potential course load in order to meet the PE requirement. And um, I think one of the things that this committee needs to do is try to fix that piece. Um, my sense is if there was a good answer for non-athletes that didn't disadvantage them, um, then we, we probably will be far along the way to a solution. Um, and I think it could help with some other issues that we're uh, dealing with too. But um, Mr. Lombardi can speak to that certainly much more eloquently than I can. Yeah, I think uh, <coughs> specifically about the, 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 the waiver or the credit for athletes, uh, the feeling was if you did that for an athlete um, and they received four years, for example, of um, that requirement, mm -hmm. you could argue that equity-wise, they now have access to four of the classes that a non-athlete doesn't. 
you know, and so they're going to have to sacrifice choices and maybe art, AP, honors, um, along those lines where students playing sport would not have to make that choice. Um, you could also, the issues that were brought up were concerns. What about those students that don't particularly do play um, a sport, but they go to dance? three or four times a week. They horseback ride through it. And I know that I think Ms. Minnick has been part of, maybe part of the discussion historically, I think has been brought up. Um, right? I've talked to some of the teachers that have been here for many years, going back to Frank, Frank Tudrin, when they opened up this um, can of worms. Um, there was my student walks to school. That's two miles. My student works every day after school mowing lawns. So you really have to have, I think, you know, a, a really thought out you know, what is it you're going to consider giving um, credit for or waiver for an athletic credit, um, as well as how do you equitably imp um, implement that so students are not having to sacrifice access to the rich um, environment we've created um, academically for our students. Just one of the things, we, when we, athletic fees were discussed, athletic fees were seen as a way to supplement what was a, a drag or, you know, a diversion of funds from other educational um, goals. But in this case, we now have to say, if we spent, you know, if we even reduced athletic fees, you know, by fifty, you know, a net of fifty thousand dollars, and avoided hiring two PE teachers. So I think the math on the athletic side, as well as the equity issues, becomes um, more, you know, more complex. And, and obviously, if you didn't have an athletic fee um, for participating in, participation in sports or in certain sports, then you would allow people to take advantage of that. You might not have the equity thing where I can't pay $175, um, my family can't afford that, now you take that away, then they can participate in the sports after school and... Students on, um, students that are on... Right, free and reduced already, but, but, even, but even students who are not on free and reduced, cost. They, absolutely. they still would say that's $175 you yeah. know, for me. Because yeah. I think in equity, there's also the cost for kids who participate in athletics, there is a cost to them in that they're taking time after school to pursue an activity and they don't have time maybe for a job, maybe for some other activity that they choose that may not be athletics, it might be you know, designing robots. And, and I think that you know, there's choices that kids make. I don't want Absolutely. it to see, be seen as one direction only. Yeah. There are choices that kids make, but we're also talking about the equity and there are choices that kids cannot make because of their financial situations from when they're young. And one of those is athletics. And the problem with the equity of athletics is when you get to the high school, the people who play on the sports, on the teams, are people who have experience playing. And as a mother who had very active children in the sports programs, I understand about how much money it costs up until they get to high school. So I'm not, I mean, I think that the most money that we have should actually go to our um, academics. And I don't think it's fair to the kids that can't afford it now to lose those four classes. I would be more apt to think, why don't we try something um, like in other school systems around here do, where they have long block and then a half, uh, one block is short. So they have long short, and then you could have the phys ed be a half of a block. So everybody can still have it. And you could have the art be the other half or something else. Like that's what uh, the school my daughter ended up having to go to did, and it's a public school. And the other question I do have, I mean, that's really much of a concern for me is the equity. It's always <coughs> been for the sports, very much so. But the other concern I have, is it legal for us to, um, will the state allow us to say, okay, we'll let, call this sports and we'll say, okay, that's physical education. Because sports and physical education are actually different. When you play uh, sports, I mean, you're playing a game, and that's fine, but physical education requires learning. And I would think that if we had phys ed teachers coming in here, they're not going to just stand there and say, well, whatever, if they, as long as they're out there running around, that's equivalent to physical education, when in fact it's not. There's actual education that, that accompanies the, the, the activities, the sports. I can just sure, address the sure. legal question. It, um, sure. Just to answer the legal question, it is allowed. Um, in fact, if you um, reference the materials from the Mass Corps, when they were talking about students needing to have four years of <coughs> physical education, one of the um, caveats that was right in there from the Department of Ed was you can substitute sports for physical education, um, which it, I think is kind of a strong hint that you ought to at least think about it. Um, but then it does raise the issue yeah. of you know, equity. And I think as we, you know, as um, Dr. Provost um, directed me to talk about this with my educational leaders at the school, um, you, you know, to, to think about implementing it for next year, 
would be to either jam it into our school day, which would then be you know an immediate um, cost and budget for um, staffing, um, as well as um, kind of dismantling, I think, what we've built up over the years. We have a very rich elective program. For, we have 29 AP courses. We have a thriving art, theater um, program that really our students benefit. Um, or you do some hybrid, which is the, give them credit for athletics, but that is then fraught with inequity. And I think that on Dr. Provost's recommendation to be more thoughtful is that this may require, uh, uh, take a look at the schedule. You know, and you can't just do that. I would definitely resist that um, with everything we've got going on to um, dismantle our block system. It's that, you know, we need to be much more thoughtful to how would we do that. Um, as you know, we moved to um, everyday classes this year. And for the most part, the feedback I get from teachers and students is they like it. Now, that doesn't mean everyone likes it, and there's some things we still have to tweak, but I think on any schedule change um, to implement something like this, you're gonna be taking a look at how do you maintain the quality of what you offer, how do you maintain the opportunities for students, um, and how do you do it in a cost-effective way that doesn't jeopardize, you know, you wanna do that balance, um, keep that balance. Um, so I think Dr. Provost's recommendation to put a committee together to have a thoughtful approach makes much more sense. We've taken a hit for 10 years, in 94, um, I think if there's a plan, um, we're much better in the long run, so are our students by being much more thoughtful about how to implement um, this. I agree that we need an ad hoc committee. Right now we have another vote on the table, but that will come next. Okay. Just, one last thing. The thing Laura had mentioned I just want to get back to. The Mass Corps requires a senior year math course, but the public colleges have four units. Mm -hmm. so. Are, Even more kids are meeting this than appears on that. So I think. And our guidance counselors are very astute and they're very aware of the, um, yeah. the requirements for state school entry. And that is always part of their dialogue in regards to directing students' um, consideration of at least four years of math going beyond Algebra II, um, which is typically in our old math model, the four years of math, um, as well as you know, the, um, the foreign language. So that is definitely part of their um, dialogue with our students and directing them along that path. I mean, they, would, they would be um, in line of supporting that, but again, they understand yeah. the dynamics that we're, we're, we're facing already. And the other, I just had the same question around uh, schedules for you, but you're obviously gonna look at that. Yes, I think that would be the more prudent and um, logical way to go. When you say look at schedules, do you actually mean reevaluate the efficacy of the long block schedule? Yeah, I mean, I think we'd have to really take a look at that, you know, um, Something's have to give somewhere, you know what I'm saying? And, and, we're, and if we try to cram in four more things, um, requirements, um, kids are coming from somewhere, y you know? And again, I think we're very proud of the product we offer here at North, Northampton. Um, I think our students benefit, and they would definitely benefit from this. Um, but you, we want, I think we want to do it in a thoughtful way. There's just been a lot of time and effort, um, again, um, for our students, and we, I think it would, it, it would be a mistake not to look at, hey, can we implement this, maintaining what we have by schedule change? Is it every other day? Is it going long block, short? I don't, I don't really know, but I think it would be um, the most um, beneficial way to do it um, and look around, see how, how are other schools um, doing that. And it could be, again, a hybrid of a combination, schedule, athlete, I mean, who, who really knows, but I think that'd be the most beneficial. Something like, like rec teams been looked into, like before school and after school rec teams for kids who may not either A, want to play on a sport, a, a competitive sports team, like, um, or may not, I'm sorry? Like intramurals? Well, it, but a more formal program, like after, uh, <coughs> is, is that program already happening? No, I, I think what we find is that um, about 50% of our school is playing sports already, I mean, the numbers of students who have to, to hold a thriving, I mean, we'll, we'll support anything. We, and over the years, we've had um, Ultimate Frisbee, I guess, would be the best example. That started out as a small club years ago. Um, now, at some point over the budget season, we're gonna be coming for, um, trying to get a stipend for the um, Ultimate Frisbee. That is one of our biggest sport programs now in the high school. And that started in a club status. Yeah, um, and it may be something like that, something so, different, so, like a dance or something that's not currently offered that yeah. may, you know, it may take polling students to find out, you know, yeah. what is it that a lot of the students that are not in athletics would be interested in. 
Yeah, and, and I also think offering things before school, if that's at all possible, might be helpful to some students as well. Oh, Start early. Where's Steve? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. It's not me. It wouldn't be me, but some kids. Steve Harrell in here. here. But we, we are we're always willing and open if, if students have interest. I know there's been students that have had interest for years in volleyball. And again, it, it's, it's um, kind of like a market system. We have people that are interested, we'll support that. And we'll take that as far as we can, and I always consider that for um, acknowledgement and recognition in, in our school. So I've got three hands up. I'm going to go to Mrs. Minnick, then Ms. Duvall, then Mr. Moore. What's your suggestion? I mean, you, at first you said <coughs> that a, a stopgap would be to look at counting athletics as the PE requirement. But then you said that actually the state suggests that you consider counting them. So was that a long-term solution or was that just a short-term? Well, I, I said it, it's the closest thing I've ever gotten to a hint from the state. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that there's a preference for using athletics. Um, my concern, and I, I, I just want to reiterate it, is I don't want implementing PE, which we clearly need to do, um, to be the thing that dismantles the, the um, elective programs yeah. and the AP programs. Mm -hmm. And if you, don't, um, if you don't count athletics, then you have a lot more kids who need to come out of something in order to get PE. Um, if you adjust the schedule, that may not, may not be the case. But thinking within the context of the current schedule, that certainly is. And even thinking within the context of um, an adjusted schedule, that still may be a good strategy because um, I know there are other needs that the high school has, yeah. um, and they, they may want to address some class size issues in some other classes um, as well. And so I wouldn't want to take athletics off the table or say that it's only a short-term um, solution. I think it's probably likely to be one component of a multi-pronged approach. Um, and so I, I think, but you know, that will really be the work of the committee. But my sense is, after having looked at this pretty deeply for a couple of months now. If you don't allow students to have credit for athletics, then you're going to lose something that you value in the high school. I guess then my, my question would be, and, and this probably too is part and parcel of what the committee could discuss, uh, an ad hoc committee could discuss, but uh, Ms. Duvall was pretty brave to call into question whether or not athletics contains the learning component because the coach next to her could have punched her pretty quickly <laughs> and easily because I'm sure he would say that his coaching style contains a lot of educational component and there's much to be gained from, you know, athletics after school. But if we were to review the wellness or the, the PE curriculum, and, and, and ensured that our coaching staff was aware of and was communicating some of those concepts during their athletic coaching, then we would be farther, it would make me feel more comfortable about having athletics count as physical education. And then to follow up on that, my question was of the athletics counting as it, what, which, which ones? I mean, do we still have cheerleading at the high school? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay, so with cheerleaders, be considered, I mean, it's, it's an athletic sport. Is it, would, would, my daughter does dance and she's an incredible tap dance. Would that, would that be included? She plays soccer with yes. someone else, but not the school. Would that be included? I think that's, I think that's part I mean, of the question that was, pop, that was brought up when we said to do that. Where do you begin, where do you end? Where, you know, um, again, I, I don't have that answer because I think everyone would have an argument. I mean, cheerleaders, um, they, that's a very physically demanding so job. So I think, yeah, I, I don't, I think we have to consider all those and then create some policy and procedure. Um, I think what you're pointing out is that it's not an easy answer. It's not as simple as saying your typical fall, spring, winter sports, and that's it. And um, that's what was brought up when I discussed this with my <coughs> department chairs. This is fraught with a lot of challenges. A lot of people can make some very you know, significant um, logical um, arguments why dancing three times a week at a, you know, should be considered, why yoga should be considered. My son goes to the gym and has a personal trainer, does CrossFit. Those are all things you, 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 could, you could argue. So, so, it's not, so it doesn't just say anything about MIA um, sanctioned sports or anything. No, it, it can be anything and we can use our, our 
there's a lot of discretion. You, you have to obviously have, a, have to have a policy and procedure, just like when we give credit for um, students doing internships or work study. You know, there's, there's procedures and policies around. There's a certain weight we give it in terms of um, how many hours per week, um, and the site is approved from us to make sure it's of quality. And then would be asking, would we be asking people like from dance studios or whatnot for something or other? I mean, do we, yeah, I think that would all be the part of the um, or something. I think that would be part of the committee that would get to, together and say what would what would be the um, structure. Of, of approving that, what would we be looking for in terms of documentation? Again, if you do an internship, um, there's a site review. You know, we, we know there's a contact person and there's so many hours they must do per week. Um, so I think, I imagine, again, top of my head, there'd be something similar if we were going to go that route and let things outside of the building go. One more question on that one. Um, would the, do you see any answer for the equity to make it more equitable for everybody? No, again, that, that's what I think we'd have to do a lot of work. I think and that was the concern. It's, you know, we can pose right now the, um, the potential pitfalls and questions, and I think it takes time. Well, how would we do that? There's, there would be no way, really, to get around right now for current schedule for athletes to say, okay, my 400 athletes for four years, you don't have to take PE in class. Now, I would imagine many of them would still take PE. You know, I mean, I know a lot, many of my athletes love PE. You know, um, but still, there's no way I could get around that student that didn't participate in a sport. And, and if we said they had to take it next year, they would have to choose one of their eight classes next year would have to be PE. So whatever they have taken this year, something would have to be dropped. And it's not going to be a required class. It's going to be something not. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Moore. Yeah, just to add to that, though, I think the other option would be if, if there's a lot of no-cut sports at the high school. but. That that raises point, me, right, yes. but, that, but that raises to me the question of really the sort of idea that basically it's an extended school day then all of a sudden where we have five blocks, um, the four that we claim, and then we have the fifth block being um, the sport, and um, which means this question of credit. So we, we, we're allowed to give credit for this. Does that mean it's a credit the same way, you know, a class at Smith or an externship or something? <coughs> You get a credit on your report card, and you're only re required to take have four credits per semester. Yeah. And that was a great. That was a question that was brought back wise too. So if you're getting credit for your sport, does that mean you only have to take three classes during the day? That was a lot. You know, I just heard, yeah. and do you get a grade? I mean, you know, for your sport. In other words, is your sport a, a credit? Yeah. In the same way that all your other classes are a credit, and I think it. That's another. The other side of it, in addition yeah. to what sports are you going to allow to qualify for this? What have they just qualified for? Yeah, and do you get yeah. credit or do you waive it? And then on your transcript, what does a waive <coughs> versus a credit look like? And if a student gets credit, now those athletes potentially have earned our minimum graduation requirement that much earlier. Correct. Would we, would we have students wanting to graduate earlier? So there's a lot, again, these are all questions that get popped up. Because if you get up. five credits a semester, yes, exactly. a lot of people could do. Well, actually, yeah. a lot of them could get more than that if, if it's each sport and you do three sports in a year. You could yeah. get your 11 credits yeah. per year and be done after two and a half years. So that's why it's probably not best to implement this next year. <laughs> you know, I think that's why we. You couldn't do that, could you? Don't they expect it to be once a year? Well, I mean, my, a year? Just to answer that directly, my recommendation, although again, this would probably be discussion for the committee, is uh, that you get credit for up to one sport per year. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, I'm done. Fresh. <laughs> Freshman. <laughs> What you're trying okay. to Can I say one little Sure, please. I mean, the other side of it, to be an optimist, is that I know you have a great elective program, but that some of the PE courses could be great electives, oh. like a RAD program for, you know. Oh, the, the so PE that's what I'm teachers, saying. Like, no, no we're, we're excited. And I mean, the PE teachers are excited because you could um, have an entry-level freshman health class. You could have a senior exit health yeah. class. You could have dance. Um, dance, dance. You yeah. could have um, conditioning. You could have yoga. You, I mean, there's, there's, no, I yeah, think that's there's what, a lot of excitement yeah, for that's that. What I, I mean, this is not... Uh, I think right now we're looking at PE and we, we, we stick in the traditional, Calif maybe the experiences yeah. we had, you know, going in and coming out and playing team. You could have a team sport one for yeah. those, but you could have individuals. So there's really a lot of excitement from the PE department. And I think even our faculty would be supportive of that. But at the same time, you know, they're, they're weary of losing what we've worked really hard to, you know, get. We've had some lean years. You know, there's been overrides to support certain things and they're really weary of adding something that potentially puts, you know, a very strong program that I, that I know you're proud of, the community and the students are proud of. So, oh. Mr. Meyer. 
just um, I just wonder whether it's sort of we've we've gone around this. Um, the CMR reference to CS, is 603 CMR 2702, which is actually the structured student learning time. Um, so when we're talking about does this count and is this an extended school day, it seems um, appropriate. But they, the specific provision is to ensure that every public school provides the students with the structured learning time needed to enable the students to achieve competency in core subjects and other subjects as defined in 2702. And PE being one of those, and I'm just wondering, from looking across the Commonwealth, what is the minimum amount of actual class time? If we're talking about modifications, this is a threshold, what are we talking about? So if I go to the 1994 modification of the law that I referenced at the beginning of this discussion, the modification was to remove the minimum requirement for time. Mm -hmm. So it has to be offered every year, but it doesn't have to have any minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, yeah. that's why we don't. Push ups and we're done. <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> just, just to note as a, as a comment, the, the actual statute that puts this requirement counts military drill as physical activity that promotes, the, it's promo, all it has to do is promote the physical well-being. And, and it specifically says calisthenics, gymnastics, and military drill, but if your parents are conscientious objectors, yeah, they, can, they can get you a waiver. Yeah. So we may need to bring the drill team back. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. so we're going to need to um, make a second motion to ad hoc. So can we move the question? Uh, well, we certainly can if folks are done discussing it. We can certainly vote on it. Are folks ready to vote on the motion that's on the table? Okay. So all those in favor of the superintendent's recommendation as stated in the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. I'd so, like to make a motion. Okay. Form an ad hoc committee, ad hoc subcommittee to um, further discuss this whole issue and find a plan. Is there a second? Second. Okay. And just for clarification, I would assume that that's a committee that you would ask the superintendent to work uh, to putting together. Mm-hmm. Okay. Great. And for clarification, is this committee to discuss not only the physical education, but also the addition of the, you know, modification of math program or modification of um, foreign language, hiring additional or staff? Or whatever. What, 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 just, my, what my goal for this committee would be is to figure out how to come into compliance with PE. Okay, so That's this is it. not a mass corporate. That's right. Don't want to take on start time or anything? No. <laughs> Okay. Would that be a, like a, a mix of community and school committee and everyone? I mean, what are you foreseeing the mix to be? I think that it needs to include um, teachers, uh, representatives from different departments who are likely to be impacted. It needs to obviously include representatives from the PE department. Um, should have a representative from the health advisory board. Um, and then I would think um, at least one school committee <coughs> member from rules and policy because whatever this group recommends would have to be um, codified through rules and, rules and policy and because it will affect our policy on graduation requirements. Um, Ms. Minnick? Um, I, I want to be, uh, you said that this ad hoc committee would be specifically about looking at the PE requirement. But I want to be clear that the charge to the committee contains enough latitude that they that they will look at the structure of the schedule at the high school. So it, when you when you create the charge, I hope it will be broad enough to give them the latitude they need to examine different things that may affect the PE requirement while not being so broad that they feel like the, it, their charge isn't to figure out how to get the, the core stuff. But I think it should be clear that they can go beyond just looking at PE. I just, I'm always concerned when you put the charge out for a committee that if they need to know what, <laughs> what they can do and what they can't do. Any other comments about the committee? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So uh, thank you, Ms. Lombardi. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Move forward on that. Okay. So now we move to the business administrator's report. Turn, as well as the personnel report, and I'll turn to Swab again. Okay. 
The first report you've got there is a standard budget report on where we stand as of uh, the beginning of this week or the end of last week, I guess. Uh, just a couple of highlights on it. You will notice there's a couple of areas where the, if you were looking at the percentage of expenditures are rather high, but that is not abnormal in a school department. For example, one is instructional equipment, and ideally you do spend all of your instructional equipment money at the beginning of the year, so you've got that on hand. On page two of the report, um, there are two accounts that have deficits. The first one is the employee retirement cost, and that is one that formerly, this is re, um, related to the sick leave buyout for employees at the time of retirement, and in the past that cost was funded in the city budget and through the municipal chargebacks that we filed with the Department of Ed, it was reported as a municipal expenditure for education. A change was made this year that the sick leave buyback is being charged directly to each department's budget. So we're seeing that expenditure here as a deficit because it wasn't something that we budgeted at the time of the budget. So as we go through the year, we will be looking for funds to transfer within our budget to be able to cover that by the end of the year. What, tell me what line that was again. I just kind of lost it. It's on the second page. It's yeah. the fourth line down, employee retirement. Okay. And then the other one um, is the second one up from the bottom. It's one of the special ed tuition categories, and that's showing a deficit of just under $300,000. We actually spent quite a bit of time today looking at that. Um, the overall special ed tuition is not as negative as this looks. What we found is that we have a number of kids that we've charged the local budget that actually can go to school choice because there are kids that we will be billing through the school choice program and getting those revenues in by the end of the year. So we'll be doing some adjustments on our books and charging some of those tuition bills to the school choice revolving account and that should be corrected hopefully by the next budget report. Any other questions about the, um, about the report? So I, I just have a question um, because I sat with the mayor and, and he has pointed out in the past that even that, you know, sick leave buyback is an expenditure that's born out of the city budget, not saying necessarily this shows up um, in our budget. Um, we did have an adjustment during the previous fiscal year where a custodian um, was cut from the budget and then that custodian's expense was then taken over to the city's budget. Um, and then our budget was adjusted downward to reflect that transfer. I'm just wondering, can we look forward to a similar counter, you know, balancing transfer? If we're taking on this, will our budget be increased by the amount of the sick buyback so that we're not in a net negative based on this change in policy? Uh, you know, I think we, I, uh, certainly that would be I think that would definitely be taken into consideration. Just because we, are, we do have yeah. the largest number of employees yeah. of any department. Yeah, I think the I think what's mainly at issue is that the three, the two school departments and the city have kind of diverged mm -hmm. and independently each department has made some decisions to move away from the city's sick leave buyback policy and and so and in fact have created more generous policies that, mm -hmm. that are more and so um, it just seemed to make more sense to have it just be directly reflected in the budget. So and it's an expense, whether it's an indirect or not, it's an expense that'll have to be accounted for in the budget. So I would expect that that would have to be accounted for. <coughs> yeah. I'll sit on that one. The next few reports in the packet actually relate to the completion of the end of year financial report to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for last year. The report was uploaded, I think, around December 6th to the Department, uh, November 6th to the Department of Ed, so it has been completed and filed. The first three pages are actually one, one report out of that. And if you flip to the last page, is actually more useful for a quick summary. What this report does is based on the completion of the overall report, it takes all of the Department of Ed expenditure categories, which you see down the left-hand side, and all the various funding sources, which you see across the top, and reports how much is spent in each of those categories across all of our funding sources and come up, comes up with a total expenditure for education of just over $43,500,000. And it shows you where each of those funding sources come from. Uh, the school committee appropriation being the biggest piece, the city appropriation for municipal expenditures, things like the debt on school projects and the employee insurance being the second large pot of that. But it gives you the picture across all the various funding sources. The next two reports um, also feed out directly 
upon completion of this report, it shows where we stand with our actual spending versus our net school spending requirements. So the first one you see is the fiscal 14, where it shows that our required net school spending was $28.6 million, and our actual spending, which again is school committee, as well as those municipal expenditures, was $32.5 million. So we did exceed net school spending, which is very common across the state right now. And you have the same calculation for FY15 based on the appropriated budget for 15, assuming we spend everything, and then the estimated municipal expenditures, again, shows that our expected net school spending for FY15 will exceed the required amount. The next four reports are actually reports that I put together as part of doing the backup for the Department of Ed, and I thought they might be interesting for the school committee to see some of them. Um, running through quickly, the first one shows the amount of grant revenues from various sources that come into the Northampton Public Schools, both federal, state grants, and in the various programs for a total of $1.8 million in grants that comes into the school department. And going hand in hand with that, right behind it are the grant expenditures by school for the same fiscal year period. And it is normal for your revenue not to equal your expenditures because things can flow over different fiscal years. But again, using round numbers, it shows that $1.8 million, almost $1.9 million was spent out of grants in fiscal 14. The next one is a, a summary that I've used in the past, and this would be something I would, I would see continuing this out into the future showing year by year what the municipal expenditures for education are because those aren't captured as easily in any of our budget documents so this kind of puts everything on one page for us to look at so you'll see that in fy14 our actual municipal expenditures for education by the various city departments that are listed here was just under 13 million dollars and we're actually projecting about the same amount in fiscal 15. And I'm trying to see if the sick leave buyback shows on this one. Or yes, if you actually look about the middle of the page under the retirement section, you'll see the sick leave buyback has $108,000 actual in FY14. And in 15 projected, you're seeing zero. And that's because what we just talked about, that's going to be moved into our actual appropriation for 15. And the last sheet there is giving you a, a snapshot of just the instructional expenditures by school by the main, the broad categories of funding sources that we have. So basically, out of that 43 million I mentioned earlier for total expenditures, which is debt and transportation and employee benefits, a little over 20 million of that is on direct instruction for students, and this shows you from the various funding sources and the various schools. So is this pulling data from the end of your report, or is there, is there any, any adjustment to, let's for instance, the municipal expenditures for education, would I see the same numbers if I went to the end of year report that's given to Yes, me? I don't think it'll be uploaded for a while. Okay. I don't know how long it takes them to get all the districts in the state uploaded, but yes, these are the same numbers. So this is based off what I fed into the report that goes up to the Department of Ed. Thank you. Any questions about, uh, about these reports? I just have a question. The instructional expenditures by school um, with all funding sources. I'm looking at, uh, I believe, the grants right now. <coughs> the school choice. Why are they so? The total so different by site. I mean, like JFK only has 125,000 in grants, but everyone else has over two. I don't know if the district. Does. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. Grants is the easier one to answer to some degree. Mm -hmm. A lot of the grants that come in are geared to specific programs. Um, special ed being one area. Some of the programs are geared only to early childhood. So for example, a lot of our special ed programs for early childhood, the it numbers the numbers the show up at Bridge Street. Hmm? Right, yeah, I see that, but it went back up at the high school. I mean, it's at 205 at the high school, it's 125 at JFK. I'm just wondering, are people just not applying for as many grants at JFK? Or? My sense is the, gr the grants that we have here, there's really not a lot of competitive grants. Um, that we can get. It's really hard to get competitive grants. The number of grants that I saw as I worked on the state report, um, I was surprised at the number of grants that we had. So I think that the grants that we have are pretty good and, and support a lot of programs. Um, I'd have to dig deeper to see what the difference is, because high school you typically don't see a lot of grants, so there's got to be some grant driving the high school numbers. Well, and that's what I was wondering, and what's not driving JFK, because it's the only one that seems so inequitable. 
can't tell by quickly looking at the grants what drives. Oh, for example, we've got a kindergarten grant that would, you know, of a hundred thousand that's only going to pertain to the elementaries. Right, and if it was JFK um, and NHS that were similar around, but I mean, it's one twenty-five and NHS is two oh five, which is the next one up. Yeah. Everything else, I understand, being an elementary school, we have the early education, but I, it's just really JFK that I'm wondering, you know, why they're so low in grants. Is it that they don't have? I don't know. Why would the high school have it? I don't know. I mean, sports program. I'm not real sure why they don't have any, the grants here, though. Okay. I'll see if I can find any more backup on that at some point. School choice, I think, is just the result of how the budget was put together for this year in terms of what was designated as school choice expenditures, and that's something that the superintendent and I have talked about for next year is probably making some changes on how we handle the school choice versus the, the, the appropriated budget. Okay. Now, does the school choice, when it goes into the budget, does it have anything at all to do with... That's how many kids are at your school? No, I think it's okay. just what the school committee chose to spend the school choice money on as it did the budget for fiscal. Okay. 14 and 15 I'm dealing with now. Okay, so that is that, but but Leeds school, so each school has a different Detroit, program. Detroit. Leeds school has like, Detroit. also has the Clark Street over there. And I, um, they're getting their um, technology before it's the rest of the different elementary school. And I'm wondering, is it because if we're not taking the school choice by which by the kids that go there, um, Leeds gets all that money that Clark School does, and they get to do their stuff first. Is I mean that's a rental account. That's a facility rental account. So that money right. is earmarked for Leeds. Okay, but see what I'm I guess what I'm not understanding is because that's a rental account. Um, at the preschool program at Bridge Street isn't. It just doesn't seem equitable that that Leeds School should get the money as opposed to it being distributed into the budget and then distributed back out. That's all. Because, I mean, Leeds itself, all of the different schools have something that they have to deal with on, I mean, on some level, the preschool or whatever. I mean, so I'm just saying, I don't understand why that money, $30,000, can't come into the budget and go out as opposed to Leeds getting to have it as a rental charge because it's actually a, Leeds as part of the district. Some of this I'm not sure I can answer right now. We'll be looking at a, lot, at a lot of this as we go through the budget process for 16, and I'm actually looking at a lot of it for 15. Once the state report was finished, my next project is kind of tearing apart the 15 budget okay. to get an understanding of the 15 budget. So some of this may more come to light as we go through the okay. next budget process, and we'll be probably recommending some changes as we go. Well, I was just, because that's been one of my concerns was the equity of that, of, of Leeds actually getting the, the money, and yet all the schools have to deal with some sort of pro I mean Ryan Road has the VINs over there that's renting an office but it's also from us and it helps the school and stuff like that I mean the public school the private school of Clark we just voted in tonight I mean as as a district so that's all I'm saying is I just think that the money shouldn't go directly to one school because all the schools have something they have to deal with and it should go in and out to everything and JFK should get more grants <laughs> whoever's writing those <laughs> Okay. Any other questions or comments regarding the um, the report? Um, okay. Um, is there a personnel report this evening? Yes. Very short one. Things are finally calming down as we get into school year. So this is for October. So you see for new hires, we just had four new hires, including myself, officially on board here. Um, <laughs> and only one separation. Um, no retirements, which is always good in the middle of the year not to have those. And then you've got three promotions and transfers listed there. Okay. Great. Any other um, any questions about the personnel report? Hearing none, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Uh, I had planned to talk about the hockey issues at the end of my report, but seeing as Mrs. Grimaldi has hung in there for this whole <laughs> meeting, I think I'll start with that. That's awesome. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I guess I want to just advise the, the committee of um, the direction that I have given the athletic director with this because I acknowledge it's problematic. Um, so, the issue um, comes to light, as Mrs. Grimaldi correctly said, that there was a $500 athletic fee imposed for hockey this year. Um, and as we researched it, um, we couldn't find a school committee vote to authorize that fee. Um, the, and in fact, we couldn't even find a school committee vote to authorize the $300 fee. Um, but that seems to be a fee that sort of was created democratically among hockey parents, and it doesn't seem to be controversial. So what I have um, 
directed the athletic director to do is to <coughs> to collect the $300 at this time that everyone's used to paying, although I can't truly say that that was ever authorized by the school committee, and then um, to inform parents that she'll be making recommendations um, shortly to the school committee regarding the whole athletic fee structure. So there may be an opportunity to collect more fees. There may be an opportunity to collect less fees and refund. Um, but it, it just seems to me that we had a number of transitions um, of, of leadership in different programs. And I think the process of having fees actually legitimized by the committee seems to have sort of, that, that trail has sort of gone off at some point. Um, so that's one thing that I, that I will want us to really clarify very soon. Um, so just continuing on, um, on October 10th, I was excited to learn that Northampton had been approved for a district capacity building grant. Uh, this grant will bring the committee, the association, and the administration together with representatives from other city departments to collaborate on efforts to improve our educational opportunities. Um, the grant application, which was written by Julie Spencer Robinson, focused on increasing summer programs for Northampton students. Um, Ms. Hennessy sits on that group with us, and I'm looking forward to just keeping you advised of um, where we get with those efforts. Then on October 15th, I learned that Northampton High School was one of 15 schools nationwide to be awarded a Lemelson MIT Invent Team grant. Uh, Mrs. Dollard's award-winning application provides her students with over $8,000 to research and develop a self-feathering oar to enable individuals with disabilities to participate in the sport of rowing. Uh, Jonathan already did this, but I'd like to um, recognize the accomplishments of our fall sports teams. Um, so to the, I'd like to offer my congratulations to the girls soccer team for winning the Curdie Fielding League with a record of 5-1-1. One, and one. The field hockey team for finishing as co-champions of the Central League with a record of 15-2-1. and one. The boys cross country team for their North Valley and Western Mass championships with a flawless 7 and 0 record. And to the girls cross country who also went undefeated with North Valley and Western Mass championships. And I'd also like to congratulate <coughs> NHS golfers Gina Whalen who placed second at the Western Mass Girls Golf Championships and Chris Soderberg who qualified for the Western Mass Boys Golf Championships. I'd also like to thank the Northampton Fire and Police Departments for conducting their first round of fire and lockdown <coughs> drills, testing our procedures enable us to identify and begin to correct a few deficiencies, um, which is the main point of doing drills. And I'm happy to report that um, the small number of issues that were identified have already begun to be corrected. Um, since the time of our last school committee meeting, We've certified more than 30 staff district-wide in the use of physical restraint as required by the Massachusetts physical restraint regulations. We've also um, received our wireless access points for Leeds and JFK. Um, so now we're in the process of planning installation at those two schools. So then we'll have three of our schools Wi-Fi. Um, the design firm of RDA Associates has finished preliminary designs for Leeds and Ryan Road roofs. Um, and unit costs have been calculated using preliminary costs. We'll be meeting with RDA and STV, the owner's project management firm, um, next Thursday to walk the roofs and review designs. Simultaneously, RDA will be sending the preliminary estimates out for an estimating company for firmer numbers. And the city is on the, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, the funding for uh, MSBA is on board for the January meeting, at which time we'll formally be uh, notified whether or not we're um, qualified to go through to the final round, although all the indications at this point are very positive. We've also uh, confirmed our reimbursement rate for the project, which will be 56.26%. And then finally, I'd like to update the committee on the highlights of this year's MASS, MASC joint conference which I attended with Ms. Duval, Ms. Hanna, and Ms. Nykerchuk. 
I uh, attended sessions on school choice, STEM education, designing inclusive playgrounds, managing the opiate crisis and the strategic use of financial data, and legal issues concerning social media. But I think the most important session um, was the MASS annual business meeting at which we discussed uh, the foundation budget review process, which is currently ongoing. Um, as you know, for the um, just the second time in the past two decades, the commission, um, which was authorized at the time of Chapter 70 to review the Chapter 70 formula and foundation budget on a regular basis, is meeting. Um, and although dates for the hearings in Western Mass have not yet, um, I mean, sorry, the, the dates for hearings in Western Mass have been determined, but the locations haven't been set yet. So there will be a hearing somewhere in our part of the state, Saturday, January 10th, and Saturday, January 24th. Um, on your table in front of you, I um, gave you some talking points uh, that um, we prepared based on model talking point language from MASS, um, which I think boils down the problems in the foundation budget, but I can boil it down even further by saying it really comes down to four issues for me. Um, one is that the foundation budget was created in 1993, and schools are a lot different now than they were in 1993. Um, one of the biggest differences is technology. Um, I remember in 1993, the school I was working in had one computer with internet access that people signed up for time in the library. Um, so the the formula and the foundation budget hasn't been adjusted to take into account all of the needs we now have in technology, Wi-Fi capacity, bandwidth capacity, all of the devices. It's still kind of operating on a 1993 notion of what technology was. Um, the other um, thing which was a problem from the beginning but still is, is that the formula grossly underestimates special education needs. Um, when you look at the formula, um, it's estimating that you will have about 5% of your population identified as having disabilities. Um, right now we're well over 20%, um, which may be high compared to the state, but even if we were at the statewide average, it would still be three times the incidence that's assumed in the formula. Um, and so um, I will be planning on working with my colleagues from the area to attend the conference. It would encourage any of you who um, wish to attend the conference and offer testimony to use the talking points sort of as a basis for um, any testimony you'd like to give. And that's my report. Okay. Mrs. Minnick? Just on that last topic, um, last night was a board meeting for the collaborative, and they recently conducted a survey of not just collaborative participants and users, but anybody with whom the collaborative has contact. They sent out over 12,000 surveys. Sadly, they only got 500 responses, but many of those were from teachers. And they, they asked them about what makes their jobs hard, what, what's the biggest challenge that they face, and they clustered their answers. They looked for keywords and clustered the answers. And the three thing, top three things that teachers said really worried them or frustrated them in their classrooms were the number of students with behavioral needs, the number of students that need ELL services for which teachers feel unprepared, and the great number of increasing demands, most of them coming from the state, which translates to the evaluation system, I think, but also just the, the idea that there are unfunded mandates. And you covered two of those things, sort of, in, yeah. in your, so it seems to me that the foundation formula, uh, change, fixing that will also fix some of the, some of the issues that our teachers are facing on the front line in the classroom. Yeah. Any other comments about the superintendent's report? Okay, so, um, there's no new business scheduled for tonight. Uh, future business and meeting dates, we have a school committee meeting scheduled for December 11th, 2014, at 7.15 p.m. here at JFK. And I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? 
Second. Okay, hopefully. Really? Is there a second? <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned.